of the rich young ruler. Amen. But prior to me getting into the lesson tonight, I have just been led all day today just to talk a little bit about compromise before I get into the into the teaching tonight. Here in the church and over the internet, we need to focus on a church that doesn't compromise the word of God. Amen? There are too many churches today around the world their focus is just wanting to bring in people. So they, comp comp they compromise that by telling them what they want to hear, bringing them in. I, I just, this has been troubling me all morning, all afternoon, about the compromise everyone is, is taking place in the world today. They're not placing their faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. They're not teaching the word of God. They're compromising. They're giving the feel-good messages, trying to get the people into the doors. That's not going to save your soul. Amen? The blood of Jesus Christ. The healing blood. The forgiving blood. The powerful blood. The blood that will solve all problems in our lives was that precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the basics, church. We need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. This church will not compromise the word of God. Pastor Brad will not compromise the word of God. Pastor Michelle will not compromise the word of God. When we have Brother Jerry in here preaching the word, he doesn't compromise the word of God. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. The only answer to our problems in this world and in our lives, amen, is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This has been on my heart all day today, and I know it's not the message that I have prepared, but I just, the, the compromise. It's just, we cannot compromise our walk with the Lord. We need to place our faith in his finished work at Calvary. Trust in him. Amen. He'll see us through our worldly walk and into our eternal life. Amen. And the only way we can reach that is by putting our faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. My teaching tonight, again, is the rich young ruler and the thing that he was searching for in his life. And it's the thing that a lot of us are searching for in our lives today. And we'll learn about what was missing in his life and what was missing in a lot of people's lives or is missing in a lot of people's lives today. For our opening text, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Mark, chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 17 through 18, but the, the text tonight will go all the way up to... Uh, chapter 20, or verse 27. But for the opening text, we'll talk about chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, and that's going to be found on page 1734 in the Expositor Study Bible. Uh, my material for tonight uh, was obtained through the commentary, Jimmy Swagger commentary on the book of Mark and the Expositor Study Bible. So Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, the rich young ruler. And it's something we've heard before, but the Lord just led me. I, I felt uh, he wanted me to touch on this again this evening. And when he was gone forth into the way, refers to him the next morning leaving the house and going towards Jerusalem. We're talking about Jesus Christ. There came one running and kneeling or kneeled to him. He is not asking for physical help, but rather for spiritual help. And asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? In the first place, one cannot inherit eternal life. 
It is a free gift which comes with the acceptance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we'd ask that the true teacher come forth, Lord. Anoint this message this evening, Lord. Anoint the ears, Lord, and the hearts of those that hear it, Lord. And Lord, we just ask that it blesses them, helps them to understand your words, Lord. And Lord, just leads them to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we want to give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You can have, have it all, according to this world. But something very important is missing in a lot of people's lives, including the life of the rich young ruler. Some of us, or dare I should say most, are not thinking properly about life. We lose our focus on spiritual things and tend to focus on things of this world. Money, fame, fortune, worldly possessions, and so on. We have to remember that money can't buy everything. Deep down inside of us, there is something missing. And that something is a personal relationship with our Lord. Amen? That's what was missing in that rich young ruler's life. That is what is missing in so many people's lives today, is that relationship with our Lord. The rich young ruler realized that even though he had worldly riches and possessions, he still didn't have the thing that he wanted most of all. And that was eternal life. Again, that was the most pertinent or most important thing that he was seeking. And that was why he sought out Jesus Christ, hoping to obtain that eternal life. He was looking for things spiritual and eternal. Amen. Like a lot of us today. In verse 17, the rich young ruler asked Jesus, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Do. Men and women ever seek to do something. Work, good deeds, thinking their works will bring them spiritual blessing. In effect, no one can do anything which will give them eternal life. Amen. Amen. For no matter what they do, it will never be enough. In truth, one does not have to do. Because all that is needed has already been done. Jesus has already paid the price. I said, Jesus has already paid the price in full for all of us at Calvary's cross. Amen. We have to remember that one cannot inherit eternal life. It is a free gift which comes with the acceptance of Jesus Christ. If you would turn to Romans chapter 10, let us look at that chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 10 in Romans chapter 10. And that's page 1990 in the Expositors. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. How to receive. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
Confess that Jesus is the Lord of glory and the Savior of men, and that he died on the cross that we may or might be saved. And shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead pertains to the bodily resurrection of Christ as is obvious. And you shall be saved. Isn't that simple? Doesn't say anything in this scripture about works, does it? Or doing something through good deed. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall, not you might, or maybe, you shall be saved. Amen? What a glorious promise. Verse 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, pertains to the word, believing in a mode of thinking, not of feeling. The believing has to do with believing Christ and that his sacrifice of himself atones for all sin. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When faith comes forth from the silence, from its silence to announce itself and proclaim the glory and the grace of the Lord, its voice is confession. Amen. Let's look at verse 13. For whosoever, what does that mean? Anyone, anywhere, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Again, what a great promise. His words do not lie. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Speaks of the sinner coming to Christ, but can refer to any believer. And with whatever need, the cross is a means by which all of this is done. So whatever our need is tonight, call on Jesus. Amen? Bring it to the Lord. He'll take care of it. He's true to his words. They cannot lie. Verse 18. We'll back in Mark again. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one who is God. This was not meant to state that Christ himself wasn't good, but rather that the word good be placed in its proper perspective, meaning Christ is God. In verse 19, you know the commandments. So Jesus is drawing the attention of the young man back to the word of God in both a positive and a negative sense. Positive because, because the word alone holds the answer. This book, the word of God, holds all answers to all problems in our lives. Every answer is found in this book. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know the commandments, and again, he draws the attention of the young man to the word of God in both a positive and negative sense. Positive because the word alone holds our answers, and negative because it will show him as a mirror where he was wrong. And the Lord tells him, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor your father and your mother. He's pointing out something that pertains directly to the rich young ruler. Notice here that in all of the Ten Commandments, Jesus only deals with six, i.e. those which pertain to man's dealings with his fellow man. Jesus Again, we know God is omnipotent, omniscience, omnipresent. Jesus knew exactly what the problem was before this young ruler ever came up to ask for eternal life. 
And Jesus directs him back to the word of God and hits on those six commandments, dealing with the issues that are affecting this young ruler's salvation. In verse 20, And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I observed from my youth. We have to remember there is no eternal life in just keeping the commandments. Amen? As wonderful as that is, had there been, he would not be seeking the satisfaction of his conscience. For those who are depending on their good works, they too will find an, an emptiness in their hearts because such cannot save us. If one is only truly saved, one will not thirst again. Amen? If you are truly saved, you will not thirst again. I'm going to turn to the book of John, chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. That's page 1846 in the expositors. And normally I have all these pages marked, so I'm not flipping through things, but for some reason... I didn't mark them tonight, so you have to give me a few seconds. Bear with me, please. 1846, book of John, chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water, water of the world, shall thirst again. Presents one of the most simple, common, yet at the same time profound statements ever uttered. The things of this world can never satisfy the human heart and life, irrespective as to how much is acquired. But whosoever, again, anyone, no matter what your status is in life, but whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Whosoever means exactly what it says. Christ accepted is spiritual thirst forever slacked. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water bringing up into everlasting life. Everything that the world or religion gives pertains to the externals. Amen? But this which Jesus gives deals with the very core of one's being and is a perennial fountain of life. Life more abundant here. Life eternal when we're called home. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Verse 21. We're back in Mark. What can I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Isn't it amazing? He came to Jesus. He told him about how he obeyed the commandments ever since he was a child. Jesus knew that he was lying to him. Jesus knows that no man can uphold each and every commandment, only one, and that was our Lord. But even though he knew he was lying, he still loved him. Jesus loves us no matter what we've done in our lives. Amen? We can be the worst sinner on the face of the earth. And he loves us. Uh, Brother Brad preached on, preached on John 3.16. You know, God gave his only begotten son. Amen? For us. Because he loved us so much. So it doesn't matter where we come from in life. 
what we have done in our life, Jesus loves us. Amen. Amen. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatsoever you have, give it to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Amen. The young ruler thought he had eternal security. But Jesus told him he lacked one important thing. The thing that stood between him and eternal security was his covetousness, which was a lie, because we know Jesus, let me back up, I skipped ahead of myself, was his covetousness, the care for his worldly possessions and greed, and the way he treated his fellow man. That was the thing that stood between him and eternal security. The young ruler told Jesus again that he had kept the commandments, which he knew. Again, Jesus knew the truth. But he loved him enough to give him the answer. Amen. He loved him enough to give him the answer to eternal life. He loves us to give us the answers to eternal life. Amen. Each and every one of us. Christ tells the young man here and all others, others for that matter that salvation is in the cross alone and it is only by and through the cross that we can follow Christ. Jesus was not making the selling of one's goods and giving to the poor a criteria for salvation. He was merely putting his finger on what was keeping this young man from having eternal life. The young man's love for his worldly possessions, his pride, his power, was greater than his love of God or for God. Sadly, he lost his soul because of placing his faith in worldly things rather than God. I'm speaking of one attempting to live for God by any other means than faith exclusively in Christ and the cross. Attempting to live for God by any other means other than faith exclusively, exclusively in Christ and the cross, then there will be no problem with one's personal possessions. Amen? God doesn't expect us to give away everything we have. We shouldn't worry about it if he does, because he's going to see to all our needs. Amen? He's going to meet all of our needs, regardless, if we're placing our faith truly in his finished work at Calvary. But he doesn't expect that. He's going to supply our needs, meet our needs. But he knew in this situation that is what the rich young ruler's problem was. He was placing his faith in his worldly goods and not placing his faith in God. Amen. The key always is faith in Christ and what Christ has done for us at the cross. We have to remember that Jesus loves all of us, no matter what our shortcomings may be. He is always there with open arms, waiting to welcome us into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord, no matter what we've done. He's always there waiting with open arms. Several months ago, Pastor, Pastor Brad was preaching. I can't remember the exact message, but I, I was closing my eyes, praying, and I just, I just pictured the Lord standing there with open arms, saying, come home. The door is open. The door is open, and I'm waiting. Amen? He's there for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Always there waiting. In verse 22, and the rich young ruler was sad at that saying and went away grieved. For he had great possessions. This concerns the attitude of multiple millions of people today. 
they, as the young ruler, desire salvation, but on their own terms. But on their own terms, not our Lord's terms. We have to remember the only possession that really matters is eternal life. We've, we've talked about this before. We have to focus on the big prize. Our life here on earth is just a, for a short period of time. Eternal life is forever. Amen? So we have to keep our eye on the prize, and that prize is eternal life. Eternal life, putting our faith in Jesus Christ accepting him as our savior we had a good message this morning you know we and it's not a hard it's it's not a hard message and trust me i'm the first to admit before i put my faith in jesus christ i thought it was impossible for me to ever get to where i'm at but guess what i placed my faith in jesus christ and what he did for us at calvary's cross I can look forward to the grand prize, eternal life. Amen. And it's so easy to obtain. It's so easy to obtain. Thank you, Lord. We have to remember the only possession, again, that really matters is our eternal life. The problem was his heart. It was fastened onto his possessions and would not let go in order to follow Christ. The answer to this question is twofold, and it's pretty simple. If the possessions we have in this world capture our heart, then they have to go before Christ can be followed. If we put our faith in our possessions and they capture our heart, we have to put those possessions aside and follow Christ. Two, if the possessions do not capture the heart, they are of no consequence, and Christ can be adequately followed. The idea is that one cannot follow both. Jesus clearly tells us this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And I'll read that chapter also. Chapter 6, verse 24, page 1656. Father's Study Bible, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And again, you don't have to follow along with it. It just, it just touches on this about having two things, trying to worship two different things at the same time, our worldly possessions and Christ. And Matthew tells us, through the blessing of the Holy Spirit here in verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is flat out stated as an impossibility. It is total devotion to God or ultimately, it will be total devotion to the world. The word mammon is derived from the Babylonian mimim, which means anything at all. So we either serve our worldly possessions, or things of this world, or we serve God. We can't have both. We can't be a fence writer. It's one way or the other. Amen? It's one way or the other. And the word clearly states that. Here in Matthew. Let no one think this message was for the young ruler only. It applies to all of us. Again, the only possession that really matters is eternal life. Amen. In verse 23, we're back in Mark. I apologize for bouncing around so much, but I feel these other passages directly linked to what the teaching is on this evening. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they who have riches enter into the kingdom of God? 
It is not the riches which constitute the sin, but one's attitude towards them. It is very difficult for the wealthy to get into heaven and have eternal life. However, we must remember all things are possible because of God. Only God can get us into heaven. Riches seem to give many a false sense of security. Our security must not be placed in our worldly possessions, but in the message of the cross. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Again, many who have riches tend to trust in those riches more than they trust in God. They think because of their wealth, they can buy everything and anything. However, there is only, however, there is one thing they can't buy with all the money in the world, and that is their salvation. Amen. You cannot buy your salvation. All millions have tried, but to no avail. You cannot buy it. Well, and I'm not talking just multimillionaires. We are all rich in some way or the other. Okay? We have, we're rich because we have good friends. We're rich because we have a good family. We're rich because we've got clothes, food, shelter. Okay? You don't have to be a millionaire for this to hit home. Our riches here on earth or in this world cannot by our salvation. In verse 24, and the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? The reasons the disciples were astonished at Jesus' words were because they thought through their Jewish, Jewish faith that riches and wealth were a blessing from God. In other words, the religious leaders felt that the more you were rich or the more blessings you had, the more God looked upon you and favored you based on your status in the community and your riches. Meaning that they were right with God because they had so many blessings. Jesus uses the term children to bring them back to a child who doesn't grasp after things of this world nor seeks after them. Riches mean nothing to kids. So Jesus tries to bring them back to the mentality of a child. A child doesn't ask for much. You know, they're happy if they've got clothing, they've got food, they've got shoes, they've got shelter. As a small child, Riches mean nothing to a small child. And that's what Jesus is trying to focus their attention back to the mentality of a child. Again, Jesus uses that term children to bring them back to a child who doesn't grasp after things of this world nor seeks after them. Riches mean nothing to a child as long as they're receiving the basic things of life. And we talk about that food, water, shelter, and so on. So Jesus is telling his disciples, as well as all others, that one must have the attitude of a child toward worldly riches. Amen? Don't put your faith in them. In verse 25, Jesus states, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The idea of this proverb is that it would be easier to get a camel through this small opening than it would be for a rich man to be saved. Again, they are placing their trust in worldly possessions instead of God. You can remove all the baggage off of that camel, but the rich man has a very difficult time removing the worldly baggage. And that is preventing his salvation. We must place our faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, the message of the cross, not the things of this world. In verse 26, And they were astonished out of the measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? 
This was in direct conflict of their theology, that worldly possessions were a blessing from God, and that indicated you were in God's favor. Their theology was being completely turned over by what Jesus was telling them. They felt the rich person was the most saved of all. Those in poverty were thought to have been cursed of God. And consequently, they felt they were lost. Jesus proclaims the very opposite of what they have believed. So the disciples ask the question, who can be saved? And then Jesus gives them the answer in verse 27. And Jesus, looking upon, said, and again, this isn't just for the disciples here this evening, church, and those of you over the internet. This is for all of us. This is the answer. And Jesus, looking upon, said, with men it is Im impossible, but not with God. Again, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. All things are possible. Praise the Lord. Salvation is impossible with all men, respecting their own efforts and abilities. It doesn't matter if they are rich or if they are poor. The efforts of men to save themselves, whatever those efforts might be, are to no avail. Moreover, if we as believers fail to understand the word of God properly, we can still cause ourselves great problems. Sadly, there are a lot of Christians who spend little time and effort trying to learn and understand the word of God. This is tragic because the word of God holds the answers to all of life's problems. You've got to take the time to open up this great book and the greatest story ever told and take the time to read it. Take the time to study it. Learn the word of God. Bring the book with you to church so you can check anybody that's behind this pulpit and make sure they are preaching the word of God. Amen? So important to understand it and learn it. And let me tell you, you want to have a better understanding of the Word of God? Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That Holy Spirit's going to come into you. The Holy Spirit's going to open up your eyes. And you're going to learn and understand these great words in this book. I'm just like the rest of you. When I was unsaved, I could pick up the Bible and I'm reading it and I'm like, it's not making sense to me. I can't understand it. Just like a light switch being flipped on. Once I accepted the Lord as my Savior, opened up the book, I understand. Ask for that. Before you, before you read the Word each and every night, ask the Lord to bless you with understanding and knowledge. I ask for a blessing of understanding and knowledge, and I also ask for the ability to teach those that I may come in contact with throughout my day that I can go to the Word of God and maybe help someone. And you can get all that by just accepting the Lord. Again, salvation is impossible with men respecting their own efforts and abilities. Moreover, if we as believers fail to understand the word of God properly, it will cause ourselves problems. That's why it's so important to study the word of God. God is the initiator of salvation. The one who effects the new birth in those who believe and receive the Son. The new birth consequently makes us children of God and leads us to moral transformation. As stated, only God can do this, and not man. So the salvation process is the same for the rich as it is for the poor. Accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen? It's so simple. 
in closing argument, I shouldn't say argument, but closing comments. I'm going back to my law enforcement, waiting for the attorney to start doing closing argument. Please don't argue with me. <laughs> closing comments. So is there anything missing in our lives or in your lives over the Internet? We can have all worldly possessions, all of them that one could ever want. But the most important thing is still missing. The most important decision that we can make in our lives is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I pray that you don't put your faith in worldly possessions or your status in life. Put it in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, for blessing me this evening with the ability to teach these words. Lord, I would never be able to do this without your help and your anointing, and I thank you so much. I ask, Lord, that you be with each and every one of us this evening on our travels home and throughout the week, Lord, that you watch over us, you protect us, you protect our family members, our loved ones, our co-workers, Lord. Lord, you continue to bless us with that Holy Spirit because we need your leadership. We need that guidance each and every day, Lord. Lord, I just come to you in Jesus' precious name. We give you all the glory, Lord, this evening. Amen. Amen.